And welcome to Friday night. It is Car Con Carne. I'm James Van Osdell here in quarantine. And Car Con Carne tonight, this week, next week too, sponsored by our friends at Happy to Meet You. So here's the thing. The world's looking at another lockdown. Are you stocked up? Do you have good stuff to eat over the next couple of weeks? Let me recommend Happy to Meet You because it'll come to your door. Free local contactless delivery if you use my promo code, Carne, C-A-R-N-E. The meat you get from Happy to Meet You is... It's the same stuff you get at the big steakhouses in Chicago. Top of the line stuff. In fact, I'm going to show you right now. Uh, For for dinner tonight, I ordered the filet from Happy to Meet You. Now, if you're a fan of the leaner cut, there you go. There's the filet cooked beautifully. It's nice, nice medium rare to medium. Uh, So I'm going to awkwardly eat that as I talk with my guest tonight. But (laughs) free local delivery use my promo code carne uh support the people who support car Cone carne this is a, a free podcast which i lovingly provide and i want to be able to support the people who support me and uh, this is a great company happy to meet you happy to m-e-a-t letter u dot com so my guest tonight uh it is a really cool sounding band I, I just wow they're called jack of none and i have with me i have ag maxine and julian and two thirds of, first of all, you're all siblings. Uh, second, you're scattered across the globe, so to speak. AG is right here in Chicago. And the other two of you are in Manila. You're in the Philippines right now as we're talking. Mm-hmm. Yep, that's right. So before we talk about Jack of None, I'm going to ask you a very Philippines focused question. Can you explain Jollibee to me? <laughs> Jollibee? Yeah. Okay, Jollibee is the Filipino version of McDonald's. See, there's a there's a big. I mean, I'm not telling you anything you don't know. There's a big Filipino community in the Chicago and suburban area. When Jollibee first opened in Illinois, it opened in Skokie, a suburb uh, of Chicago. You couldn't get near the place for about three months. Mm-hmm. The lines yep. to get their chicken joy uh, were like out the door. You couldn't touch the place. And it, <laughs> I, I, watching this from afar, I'm like, this really must be something magical. <laughs> like, it is are, if you're Filipino. <laughs> people did you are try to chicken? I did. It was fine. I had the spicy chicken, which uh, yeah. made, made the back of my head sweat. Um, <laughs> and they have the, they have the shakes. I, I forgot what kind of shake. I, I don't even know. Um, I, I forgot the names. It, it's not common ingredients for milkshakes here, but yes, uh, we um, we usually use Filipino fruits. So we have um, calamansi which is the Filipino version of a lemon. It's a very tiny green Filipino. lime. It's like a really, it's like a baby yeah, lime. Baby lime. <laughs> so the obvious thing that you're not all in the same area means that you've never really been able to be a, a touring band. Yes. But yes. now the rest of the world is on the same level you are because no one's a touring band right now. <laughs> yes. Correct. Yeah. That's but, right. um, so before we were Jack of None and we released our first album in 2016, um, I was still in the Philippines um, and we were performing um, in a band that actually included my wife as well. It was called Utakan. Um, and yeah, we were doing a lot of shows in the Philippines. Back then, my dad um, was kind of doing um, a nationwide tour of um, an album that he put out. Um, and it later came to be known as the Electric Underground Collective. Um, and we were part of that, so. Um, hey, that, that was gonna be a question because you're all so musical. And you, I, I mentioned this in my, um, in the copy I posted with tonight's live, live video on Facebook. I, I wrote that you are a dark, experimental, arty, poetic. I think your music is challenging and inspiring. It does a lot of cool things uh, and I, I, I would have to think that because the three of you are so musical and so artistic, that has to be genetic. That has to be something acquired from your family. Yeah. Most definitely. Um, my dad is an art critic, um, poet. Um, basically, he's like the Renaissance man. He yeah. does pretty much everything. And um, my mom is a performance artist, a painter, um, installation artist. And we really grew up with art coming out of our ears. And so whether we wanted that or not, that was our destiny. 
um, that was the blueprint that was set for us. And it, it, it was very inevitable that, you know, we, at a certain point, each and every one of us became an artist. Um, it's just that it's, it's all in different fields. And um, what I like about the Zoom setup is based on the backdrops, you can get a pretty good idea of the type of art that we're most passionate about as individuals. Um, I work as a, a visual artist and a poet. And um, yeah, the boys and their army of guitars and instruments. <laughs> It looks like they're competing right now. If you're listening to this after the fact, <laughs> AG and Julian, they have just walls of guitars behind them. It's it's like they're seeing who's his biggest. Like there's there's just this <laughs> stack of instruments behind each. And I think I could be wrong. I think AG wins this one just based on the zoom windows. There are twelve back there. I counted. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but and, and, Julian's goes on and on and on. That's an infinite. I have around twenty plus. So I win. <laughs> and Mac Maxine, I'm going to ask that uh, when you talk, because the Zoom meetings are what they are, if you could lean a little bit closer to the mic when you talk, just because. Oh, sure, sure. Aud audio is a weird thing with Zoom. Uh, I'm on like 10 of these a day now. Th this is all I do. I, I see things in frames. I, I don't see single, single windows anymore. I just see things in like quarters or halves, just because I'm used to this view nonstop. So you grew up around music, around the arts. Uh, you mentioned your first album, which was Who's Listening to Van Gogh's Ear? Yes. Correct. That was in, that was in 2016. Uh, you know, I mentioned the the dark, the word dark when I described you. Uh, so we're going to zero right back in on Maxine because, oh my, uh, lyrics are poetic, but they are definitely dark and sinister. And they, they play out in certain songs, depending on which one you're listening to, like a horror movie in your head. Um <laughs> Let's well, let's let's focus on that album, Confessions of a Chop Chop Lady. He bludgeoned her with an axe first, and then with a scalpel, and then with a toothpick. See, what's interesting? I, I love horror movies, and I love dark stuff. I, I yeah, I'm I'm all good with all that stuff. And people who don't get it will ask questions like, "Well, how can you even think about stuff like that? How can you even conjure these ideas or entertain these ideas?" And I think what people don't realize is, it's a release. It's a thrill. It's depending on which side of it you're on it's either a release or it's it's it just joy it's catharsis yes yes but the strange thing about me is i'm such a baby i i get scared easily um the, the, yeah things that aren't even meant to really scare people scare me and i think that that actually adds nice strange um twist to my writing style because I'm not actually taking my ideas from things I've watched. Um, I feel, honestly, I feel like the world is scary enough as it is. She, she hates horror movies. Like Jules and I love them. So we'll be, we'll, we'll tell her about them, but she herself will never watch them. Yeah. So the world being for me, um, human beings being unpredictable, um, events happening around us being unpredictable. I feel that um, when I do write and people think of it as dark, it comes from, it comes from deep in here. Um, normally I have this very sunny disposition um, and people find it kind of hard to reconcile how I can seem so upbeat, but then write so dark. But it, it's a belief of mine that all artists have more than one version sure. of themselves inside. And um, yeah, that's probably where I choose to let out my, my darkness is through my writing. Uh, Mrs. Stitcher, once upon a time, there lived a girl with very big eyes. One day, her gigantic eyes popped out like buttons. Being all too apparent, Mama took her eyes and used them to replace the missing buttons on Papa's shirt. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, my daughter. My daughter can't come to the phone right now. I am busy stitching her eyes to my husband's shirt. Could you call back later? I, I love just the originality and creativity. Ag, <laughs> Ag and Julian, when she puts these lyrics or puts the poetry on paper, do you ever have moments where you're like, "Where did that come come from? What, what are you What are you doing? Are you okay? Are you good?" I'm I'm always amazed at what she comes up with. Um, I will say though that you. 
in our creative process, it usually starts with the music. Um, and, you know, usually that means me working on something. Um, and writing music that's spooky or creepy isn't my intention. Um, I'm usually after creating something that's different um, or something that I haven't tried before. Um, so I usually experiment with dissonance. Um, and I'm happiest with a piece of music when I feel that um, it sits kind of uncomfortably um, at the threshold of what sounds familiar and what sounds otherworldly. I you definitely um, have a unique, a unique sound. I, I think I use the word <laughs> experimental. I, I was trying to explain your band to a friend of mine earlier today. And I said, I, I, I didn't really have a good frame of reference, which is always a good sign. If, if a band is original, you have a hard time describing them. Uh, I just, you know, it might sound kind of cliche or, or too easy, but I said, it's kind of like Laurie Anderson meets Radiohead produced by Trent Reznor. <laughs> That's an awesome way to describe yeah. it. Thank you. Thank you. I love meet that. Her, meet her, <laughs> Thank you. All, you. all favorites of ours, by the way. Love I believe Laurie it. I, I, I totally believe it. Uh, jumping ahead, the new EP came out today, right? Um, we released sure. we released it on Bandcamp today. Right. Well, um, that's that's where I hang out. <laughs> yes. In, in fact, that's that's how I found you. I, I want to say. <laughs> I found you on Bandcamp and then reached out to you and said, hey, I think your stuff sounds cool. Can you send me a song to play on my radio show? That's right. That was Dear Dear George. Yes. Um, from from the Bukowski album. Yeah. Yes. That, that, that's absolutely how I found you. Uh, so on Bandcamp today, the new EP, The Purpose of the Moon, um, I played a song on my radio show last week or the week before. Uh, Maimon? Maimon? Uh, now this... Is this Mamo? Mamo. Okay. I, I'm terrible. Mamo. Okay. <laughs> I, I mean, well, uh, this to me, I mean, musically, this sounds like a cross between Ween, Ween and King Crimson. Like this is, I mean, these are sounds that you don't hear in contemporary music very much anymore. I, I love, I love how you describe it. Um, and yeah, again, I was after um, kind of getting to that point where I feel like it's unsteadily um, between um, being what sounds familiar to the listener and what doesn't. Um, and it's not my intention for it to sound creepy, but I'll send it over to Maxine and Julian. Um, and Maxine will be emailing me and she'll be like, I hear a lot of tension. I'm feeling a lot of dread is <laughs> usually the word she'll use. And I'm like, well, that's, that's great. I can't wait to hear what you come up with. <laughs> so, I mean, obviously we live in a time where technology makes everything easy. I mean, we're here have basically having a phone conversation uh, on the internet. So it certainly makes being a band easier if you're scattered across the globe, but still I've got to think it's challenging. You're missing a lot of immediate connection to say nothing of the fact that your siblings, you miss a lot of that back and forth that bands that are more proximal get to enjoy. Is it, yeah. is it a challenge? Yes. Would you say it's a challenge, Julian? Um, well, when we when we wrote our first album, I was actually in Chicago with my brother. So that was the first time that we started playing our guitar riffs together and I started layering solos over my brother's music. And then the, the succeeding albums after that, we were already spread apart. So I would say that we've gotten really used to working um, together in the way that we do. And I would say that we probably work best given the current circumstances now because yes. we yes. just got in so used to it. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. It helps a lot also that we don't have to deal um, face to face with each other, some, you know, different moods. And, you know, we really, when we do communicate about music, it's really just about music. Um, it's really just about being creative. It's really just about um, being focused on, a, on this single goal of creating something that can unify us as siblings, as well as our listeners, um, those who have that kind of odd taste for what we do. 
Um, but our, our main goal has always been to, to get people to actually experience what we create and not just listen to it. So this would bring up the debate between streaming and um, listening to an actual album from yeah. start to finish. And I personally, I, I can't really get into the whole streaming thing because I'm, I'm really old school vinyl, CDs, cassettes. Um, because I, I like to appreciate the artist's works as entireties from beginning to end, all the nuances, all ev- everything that they plan in between, I think should be experienced and not just listened to in the background, like as a space filler. Um, I'm not, I, I'm sure not everybody feels that way. I but completely feel that way. I, this is something I talk about. I, I find myself talking about this all the time. We live in an a la carte world where people can just cherry pick songs and exactly. throw them up. And people come put together their playlists on Spotify or wherever, and they'll just tab through them. They won't even stick through an entire song. What I exactly. like about records or, or cassettes even, uh, you're, you're immersed in that artist's vision for, in the case of vinyl, you know, 22 minutes aside. You're exactly. sitting through the, the good songs and the bad songs but you're in it and exactly. you're not moving the needle. You're not skipping through. You are just, you're, you're along for the ride and you really you're get that, that complete. Zone. That's it. And exactly. I couldn't, and, couldn't agree with you more. And it's, um, it's a lot to put it in an analogy for me. It's the difference between having a fling and committing to an actual relationship. <laughs> so streaming for me, is like flinging around, you know, having a fling here, having a fling there. But listening to an album from beginning to end, you give it, you, you, you pause the world around you and you devote your attention to that. And that's love. And that's what makes the whole music experience so passionate and so um, compelling. No, when we were recording um, the EP, um, I introduced Maxine and Julian to Dark Side of the Moon by Pink Floyd. Um, and I can't imagine... You introduced that to, to that. <laughs> I'm sure they've heard it before, but I reintroduced them to it, which is an amazing record. Oh, my God. Um, but, yeah, I, I can't imagine um, listening to that album in an a la carte way. You have to right. listen to it from start to finish. Totally agree. Well, and along those lines, this new EP, The Purpose of the Moon, conceptually, I, I love where you're going with this, the seven stages of grief, which I believe is the Kubler-Ross model. Um, I think it started as five stages, now it's seven stages, and the EP kind of goes in order of the seven stages, correct? Um, correct, yes. I, I love the concept. So is shock and denial first? Um, yep, that's the first one. Um I, and that's basically the, the track Mamo that you played on um That I completely mispronounced just now? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that one. It's fine. I say Mama. And... <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so what I like about the concept, it goes from shock and denial to hopefulness and acceptance. I mean, that's, that's a, a, a really interesting way to go about a song cycle. Whose idea was it? Did I miss something? Did I... We're talking about the concept of the purpose of the moon. Uh, We're talking Mm -hmm. about how the album go or the EP goes from shock and denial, basically to peace and hope and optimism. I think it was it was heavily um, inspired by um, the pandemic. Um, I think a lot of art today is really changing, and um, yeah, the pandemic is really doing a lot for many artists and. You know, we have lost loved ones, um, you know, family, friends, and um, it just seemed like the most natural thing to, to discuss the process of grieving and, and to embrace it as dark as it is, as painful as it can be, in order to seek the light at the end of the tunnel. It's so interesting. I, I, maybe two or three weeks ago, I went on like an annual Lou Reed bender. I do this about once every one or two years. And he put out an Lou album. Lou Reed? Lou Reed. I have his book here. 
Oh, amazing. He put out an album in the early 90s called Magic and Loss, which was about a couple of friends of his that died. And it was about that whole cycle of life and death. And there are bleak songs and hopeful songs. And I heard that for the first time in years. And then I got this album. I really like working through that very human cycle of emotions and existence, which you yeah. tapped into here. That, that, that's a really cool concept, really cool approach. Thank you. Thank you. So, all right, the EP is available on Bandcamp. Knowing what we know about your opinions on streaming, will it turn up elsewhere as a vinyl record? Will it? Are you pressing this onto a handsome cassette? Uh, what, what are you doing with this? We're releasing um, CDs and uh, limited edition vinyl. Um, this is for those. Well, I think there's like there's an age. There's a waiting list, right, for the vinyl. Mm -hmm. People have to sign up for it. Yep. Yep, but the CDs are um, in production, so they'll be out soon. Yes, and um, I worked on the album art for, for this, um, and I, I feel that you can appreciate the whole thing best when you can actually hold it and, you know, go through each Agreed. page and, um, you know, appreciate the art and see how the art reflects the music and vice versa. Yeah, the, the, the complete vision. I, I'm totally, totally there with you. So obviously the pandemic hasn't slowed you down artistically. This is something you created start to finish during the pandemic. Pretty impressive turnaround, all things considered. Um, so if people want to keep up with you, Bandcamp is probably a great place to start. Jack of none dot Bandcamp. Yes, dot Bandcamp dot com. Um, our website is Jack of none dot net. Um, and you have links there to everything else, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. So we'll, we'll all jump off this and we'll all like your page and <laughs> in touch with you. Uh, but I think, you know, I, I said it earlier in this conversation, you don't sound like a whole lot else that I'm hearing right now. I and mean, this to me is what I, I've always kind of understood alternative music to be, something that's kind of subversive and underneath that mainstream layer and kind of pushes at the edges. Thank you. I, Thank I think you so great. much. And Thanks. I... I hate that alternative music kind of changed into a sound that like you have to sound this way to be called alternative because alternative to me always meant something else. To me, it meant something that kind of is a middle finger to the mm -hmm. mainstream. It's, it's something that runs against the tide, something that pushes boundaries, challenges the way people think or act or, or perform. So yeah, I'm right, I'm right there with you. All right, Jack of none. Thank you for doing this. Nice to see you all. Thank you for joining us. From Thank you for having Manila us. and Chicago. That's so cool.